John chapter 20, verse 1 through 2, and it says, Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. She said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. We are in week two of our series, Three Days, and uh, we're going to use for a subject today, where have you laid him? Where have you laid him? You may take your seat. Brothers and sisters, Jesus' journey to the cross was indeed difficult and lonely. He was abandoned by men, but the Father was with him. It was all necessary. Someone say necessary. necessary. Yet only he could make this journey. Only he could walk that road and drink the cup that the Father had given him to drink. He was uniquely called and uniquely anointed and uniquely qualified to suffer and die and rise again on the third day for your sins and for mine and for all who trust in him in every age and every place and in every race. A unique question we must consider is why the cross? Someone say, why the cross? C.S. Lewis says it cost God nothing so far as we know to create nice things, but to convert rebellious wills and hearts, it would cost him the crucifixion. There are some critical conversations that were had in the latter days of Jesus' life. And before we jump into the body of today's conversation, I want to live just a few of those thoughts that as someone is in their final moments and final hours it is generally those last words that matter most at once our savior was on the cross he noted in Luke chapter 23 through 34 chapter 23 verse 34 Jesus said father forgive them for they do not know what they're doing And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. This is important because the message of forgiveness is one of the most difficult messages for any believer to live out. But Jesus not only taught this message, but he modeled it for us. Jesus upon the cross tells his father, forgive them for they do not know what they're doing. And even while he asked for their forgiveness, they continued to divide his clothes and cast lots. He communicates that it's not always about one's intentions. Sometimes it's about their ignorance. Because if you were aware of who you were doing this to, you wouldn't be doing what you're doing. And for some of us, it would be easier for us to forgive others when we embrace the fact that if they were able to see me for who I really am, they would have treated me better. If they were able to have seen me for the potential that I had hidden from the beginning, they would have loved me more deeply. If they could have seen Jesus truly, they would have handled him differently. And if they could have seen the God on your life, They would have handled you differently. So how do we respond when forgiveness is required but it's hard? You take the forgiveness steps. This is critical. Because the Bible says before Jesus ever said, Father, I forgive him, he first said, you forgive him. These same people crucifying me right now, this hurts. And I honestly don't know if I'm ready. So you forgive them. 
ensure that their place with you is right, even if our place together is not right. So some of us have difficulty because we feel like we have to carry on a weight that we are not assigned to carry. There are steps to this process. And the first step sometimes has to be, Lord, you know my heart, and I am in the middle of healing. And until my heart can turn, I want to be as much like you as I can. So until my heart is ready, I'm asking you to forgive them. Because if they could have saw me as you created me, they would not have handled me as they're handling me right now. What does that mean? It means, have you ever gone? I know you've done it because there are a lot of y'all in this room. You know what it's like. You, you, you've had a birthday party on a magnet on your refrigerator for three months. And on the day of, uh, uh, 30 minutes before, on the way to the party, you got to stop by the CVS. You got to get a card. You got to get a gift card. You, you done had this on your calendar for three months. And we always wait till the last minute to get these cards. Every now and then you go in these card section. There are all types of cards. It's, 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 we're, we're so excited about your marriage. And, and we're so excited about your baptism. And, and I hope you get well. But then there's also this section of bereavement. And in the section of bereavement, generally the card suggests, I'm so sorry for your loss. <laughs> That's so critical. Because as you are learning how to forgive some people, it's okay to send them a card of comfort. I'm sorry for your loss. Because if you knew who I was and everything that was on the inside of me, I'm so sorry for your loss. I was the best thing that could have ever happened to you. And because you dropped the ball, somebody else is going to enjoy this pleasure. I'm sorry for your loss. He says, Father, forgive them. The Bible says, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Luke 23, verse 46 he called out with a loud voice, I commit my spirit into your hands. He's communicating, I've done all I can. I, I've tried to the best of my ability to dot every I and cross every T. But in this season, Father, it's above me now. And I'm giving this situation back to you. In some cases, you are carrying the weight and the burden that didn't have your name on it. The Bible says to cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. In some seasons, you got to give that back to God. It's above me now. I've done everything I know how to do. I try to do right, and I, I tried to be kosher, and I've tried to be Christian, and the devil is still showing his ugly head. So this one, Father, is above me now. So into your hands... I give my baby. Into your hands I give this marriage. It's above me now. And, and, and to your hands I give this relationship. I don't know what else to do. Now here's the problem. Because while our relationships can sometimes be rocky, they go worse because we put them in the wrong hands. But does anybody know what it's like to take something broken and put it in the hands of the potter and he begins to reshape and to reform? How do you know that? For somebody, he did it in a relationship. For somebody, he did it with a job. But if you know what it's like to be redeemed, this is what he did with your life. He reshaped me. He reformed me. He brought me back together again. And it is safe in the Father's hands. Tell somebody it's safe in his hands. He says in John chapter 19, verse 28, and in and, and old school, they would call these the seven last words. He says, later knowing that everything had now been finished and so that scripture will be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. That's important because we all know, the, what's one of the seven last sayings? Jesus wept, no, it ain't. All right, uh, I am thirsty. All right. It's one thing to know he's thirsty. It's another thing to know why he's thirsty. You got to read the scripture in its full context. He says, later, knowing that everything had been finished, the plan of God for my life has now been fulfilled. He says, and so scripture should be fulfilled. Jesus said, I am thirsty. Thirsty. I think it's okay for me to suggest this is a bit of prophetic shade. Okay. What do you mean it's, it's prophetic shade? Because they had him right where they wanted him. But where they wanted him is right where he was supposed to be. Sometimes people in your life need to know that I am not here because I can't get out. 
I am here because I am submitted. I am here because I have given my life into the hand of God. And if this season requires for the cross, then the cross is where I am going to stay. But don't get it twisted. I am not here because of your nails. I am here because of the compassion that I have for my father's will over my life. What does that mean? The, the, this is what the Bible says. The Bible says that once Jesus was with his disciples and, and, and then uh, the security came along and they had this sign along with Judas for Judas to make them aware of who Jesus was. Jesus was so common in that day that if you looked at him, you wouldn't even think he is who he was. So they asked one of his disciples, Judas, a betrayer, of Jesus, if you will kiss the one to whom he is. And uh, Judas came up on the scene with the gangster ling, and Jesus said, Playboy, whatever you're going to do, go ahead and do it. Go, go, go ahead and do it. I already know about the part that you're going to play in my life. And Jesus and Judas kissed Jesus, and they began to put their hands on Jesus. And one of the disciples shook his sword, and he took that sword, and he took that security man, and he sliced his ear off. And Jesus said, ho, 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 stop. Those who live by the sword will, will, will die by the sword. But here's the comfort he brought them. He brought them this comfort. Whatever gets ready to happen next, it's not because I can't get out. He says, don't get it twisted like a mystic. At any point, I can call up to heaven and my father will send down legions of angels who will come and fight for me. I am not here because I don't have a choice. I am here because I am submitted. I am submitted. And sometimes the submission to the will of God will cause for you to... Oh, God Almighty. Mm. The submission to the things of God will cause for Jesus to die so Christ can come alive. Jesus was his natural name, but Christ was the title, the anointed one. And until I pour everything out of you, you can't be filled with everything I have for you. So sometimes the will of God requires for your flesh to die so that the anointed one on the inside of you can come alive. And here's a problem, though. You don't, always, you don't always get to choose who pulls the trigger. Lord, now it would have been a lot easier had you let them do it. But you let them do it. As many times as I already forgave them. As many times I already looked out for them. And then you go, no, 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 no. That's why I'm letting them do it. Because this ain't about your flesh. It's about your ego. God Almighty. He says, right now I'm going for that last bit of ego that you have. So Jesus is on the cross. Everything has been completed. Everything has been finished. And Jesus says, I'm thirsty though. <laughs> now this is crazy. Because if you have ever sat beside the bed of a loved one who is passing away, one of the ways you know that death is imminent because appetite and thirst begins to leave. So why does a dying Jesus say I'm thirsty? It doesn't make sense. He's communicating to his captors that I am dying at my father's will, not at yours. This thing is different. It's bigger than anything that you can ever imagine. He's got his hand on my life. So why is this important? He then says in, in Matthew, in Matthew chapter, uh, uh, he, he then says in John chapter 19, verse 29 and 30, a jar of wine, vinegar was there. So they soaked the sponge in it, but the sponge on a stalk of hyssop plant and lifted it up to Jesus' lips. And when he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. He said, it, it is done. It's over. The plan of God for my life has been fulfilled. It is finished. Somebody say, it is finished. It is finished. Why is that important? Because Jesus puts focus on the plan of God, not on his life. So even while being on the cross, he never said, I'm finished. He said, this season, this purpose, this plan that God has for me, it is finished, but I'm not done. And that's okay because as many times as you've been hurt, it's okay to let some people know it's finished. 
I'm not finished. I know I lost my job, but it is finished. But I'm not finished. I know they walked out on me. It is finished. But I'm not finished. The plan and the purpose that God has for me has only just begun. Tell somebody, it is finished. It's finished. There's, that, there's a lot more that God has for me. It is for in this journey to the cross where we see our sable skin Savior traveling down the Via Della Rosa known as the way of suffering as he cried his eyes out with, with beads of sweat and blood coming down his face in the Garden of Gethsemane. As he traveled with the cross on his shoulder down the old city of Jerusalem Road, he took it all. He took the whips. He took the beating. He took the bruising. He took the mocking. He took the nagging. He took the shame and the guilt. And because of us, he even took upon himself our sins. And after comes the critical question, where did they lay our Savior? This season of where did they lay him is about self-evaluation. Historically, we know that where they laid him, he is no longer there. So where they laid him physically or geographically is no longer important. The important question for our generation is where have we laid him? So he is no longer dead. He is alive and he seeks to take a bode in your heart. But when he opens the door of your heart, it doesn't look like Jesus lives in there. So if you didn't allow him in your heart, where did you lay him? Where did you leave him? Where did you assign him to live when you told him there was no room in your heart? Here's the question. Does Jesus live in your life today or lay in the place of a dead savior? Have you become so distracted to maintain a healthy, consistent relationship with our God? What are some distractions that keep us from a healthy, whole relationship with our God? In some cases, it's money. The Bible says, for money is the root of all evil. No, that's not what it says. It says the love of money is the root of all evil. So it's easy to look at someone who just wants it. You just want it and you don't know Jesus, but, and money is just controlling you. But what about the Christians whose hearts are no longer controlled by the Holy One, but they're controlled by checks? When an opportunity comes, I will put down anything and everybody to go and get this bag. Don't let this bag be the noose around your neck that would have you drowning in the things of this world. Sometimes, ladies and gentlemen, money can be a distraction. Sometimes media can be a distraction. How do you know how 17 different shows come on live? what day and what time, but you can't quote three scriptures right now. It is a distraction. You know when that next movie comes out, but you don't know what year the Bible was written. It is a distraction. In some cases, can I ruffle your theological feathers? In some cases, church and religion can be a distraction. Because you think as long as you're on your post, Jesus will say, well done. You think as long as you show and as long as you serve and as long as you're on your assignment, it is a checkbox. And that is not, God says, I don't want your hands, I want your heart. And if you give me your heart, then your hands come with it. Many of us are giving God our hands, but he says, I need your heart first. I need your heart first. Sometimes, ladies and gentlemen, it is church and it is religion. Sometimes it is relationships. You love the Lord God with all your heart and still you taught it until you started dating. Now Jesus becomes optional until your heart is broken and you need the healer again. Sometimes relationships gets in the way of our relationship with God. Sometimes routine. Routine. You, 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 you live the most structured life with all of your day, but you got to find time to fit Jesus in. You know when you go to work. You know when you got to leave the house. You know when you go to the gym. You know when you got to do your homework. You know when you got to do dinner for the babies. You know when you got to go to bed. You know when you got to wash the clothes. You know when you got to fold the laundry, but there is no set time for you and Jesus. 
Everything, when everything is important, nothing is important. Someone has to be the preeminent one. The Bible says, where have you laid him? Isaiah 53 and 9. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Where did they lay him? They laid him where the prophet Isaiah said he was supposed to be. So wherever he was buried for that short period of time, it was where he was supposed to be. So in this day in your life and in your heart is God where he's supposed to be. So here's a question. Where have you laid him? What is the response of the redeemed? Those who have been changed by the blood of Jesus Christ. The response of the redeemed is different than the response of culture. The response of culture, this is just another holiday. But for those who have been redeemed, our response should be different. What is the response of the redeemed? The response of the redeemed looks like this. This is when, when I hear this thought, where have you laid him? Where have you laid him? Where have you laid him? It reminds me of a time when I heard our Savior ask that question. Where have you laid him? And, and, and it takes me back to the book of John, chapter 11, verse 34, when, 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 when the word came to Jesus that the one in whom you love, Lazarus, is dead. And, and, and he, he's, he, he's dead, Father, we need you. And, and he's working, and the Bible says he extended his stay. And finally, when he found himself going to check on Lazarus, when, he's, when he arrived there, they said, he's dead, he's done, he's finished. Like, he's already been gone for three days. And he said... Where have you laid him? Now, I am so thankful. So often we read this and we only focus on Lazarus. But can you take a cause to pause and remove Lazarus and insert your name? You may have not literally died, but you know what it's like to be emotionally dead. And yet when God found out about it, he said, where did you lay her? I'm coming to see my daughter, the one whom I love. You lost a job. You, 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 you lost a dream. You, you, your heart has been ripped in two. And the Lord responded, where did you lay them? I know what it's like to be low. And I know what it's like to stay up all night long. And I know what it's like to cry. And I know what it's like to feel betrayed. And when I took it to Jesus, I'm so thankful. He didn't say it's because of your sin. It's because you didn't die every, dot every eye and cross every T. His only words was where did you lay him? Yes, and that is the beauty of the Easter message today, that despite what you have done and how you have gotten here, if you're here today, Jesus wants to know where did they lay you? The part of you that lived before you put life on pause because you took, couldn't take any more of the pain. Where did they lay you? That's not the one that I created. That's the one who's just surviving but not thriving. Where did they lay you? I want that one. And it is the nature of our Savior that when he sees us broken and hurting, for him to ask, where did you lay them? So the response of the redeemed to the hurt of our Savior should be, where did you lay him? As we read through the gospel narrative, we see a select group of people who are seeking after the body of our crucified Lord. But there were way many others who continued to live. And my fear is although we love this day, many of us are not considering the work that had been done that although he died and bled for our sins, we continue to live on instead of occasionally coming back to the cross. And saying, where did you lay him? I love him. He fed me and my family when we didn't have anything. I remember, where did you lay him? He healed my mother and touched my auntie. I can't just forget about him. Tell me, where did you lay him? The response of the redeemed is not to continue to live. The response of the redeemed is to ask, where did you lay him? Are you doing all right? I'm going to give you this, then I'm going to leave you alone. Why, why is this important? Because Easter is about more than eggs, and dresses, and baskets, and new suits, and hats, and, and, and throwback weekends. This, this is more than, 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 than just, just him being on the cross. But the totality of Christology is understanding the virgin birth and the virtuous life that came from our Savior. 
and his vicarious death, his victorious resurrection, and the visible return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is the totality of the Christological message. We're taking it all in. Not just he was born, not just he died, but with those things happening, how do you respond? What, what do you mean? What do you mean? Um, because, uh, because of the home that I was reared up in, my parents worked and they worked hard. They supplied us with everything that we needed and gave us even a few wants. We, we came up impoverished and, and we began to live a little bit better. You don't know what it's like to, 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 to leave the place of sanctuary on a Friday night after my dad arrived around 6 o'clock because he had to drive the bus around the city to pick up all the Christians who needed a bus another conversation to get to church and had to get them back by seven o'clock because we had prayer from seven to eight and then at eight we had devotion up until 8 30 and and then pastor maybe went up to preach around 9 45 and and hopefully he would get done by 11 and sometimes we get on the altar and we had to tarry close to 11 30 and by then i've been in sanctuary from six to 11 30 I'm talking the sanctuary where you better not take a nab out. You're not hungry. Man should not live by bread alone. We don't eat in this here sanctuary. I'm talking about a family who was that devoted to Jesus. But on the way home, we were too broke to stop by McDonald's and get 39 cent hamburgers. You don't know. You don't know when them burgers were 39 cent 49. Cheeseburgers, 49 cent. We killing them. They like seven of us. We were so broke, we driving down Wayne Memorial in our 18 van. And when we get right there by McDonald's, all the children would say, lean. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Trying to see if we can turn the van into the, we're, we're, we're hungry. You don't know what, 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 what that is like. That, that, that type of commitment to the things of God, that even when things are not coming out the way that I want, it is that type of commitment. But I am so thankful that even when that, oh God Almighty, that even with that type of place in life, that generation had more faith than this generation has ever had. Had more faith. They, we, we, I, we could not get the, the power of God to turn that van into McDonald's on Wayne Memorial. But somewhere around 10, 15, 10, 30, when the altar was open and those demons came down to the altar, those mothers would get down there and drive that spirit out. That was a whole nother level of faith. So while we feel like God doesn't have us, he's the only one that's been holding you. He's been keeping and covering us the entire time. So ladies and gentlemen, what do we do? Andrew Murray says this is important because a dead Christ, I must do everything for. But a living Christ does everything for me. The response of the redeemed is where did you lay him? And I'm seeking to find the body of my Savior. I'm going to find the body of my Savior. Nobody better mishandle the body of my Savior. I'm going to find the body of my Savior. And the Bible says that they were disciples who sought after the body of their Savior. And they were women in the Scripture who sought after the body of their Savior. Newsflash! Because I am like my Savior, I respond as he responds. When Lazarus was sick, Jesus said, where did you lay him? When Jesus was dead, the redeemed said, where did you lay him? When Jesus found Lazarus, he said, roll back the stone. Lazarus, come forth. But when they found the tomb of our Savior, the stone had been rolled away and he had already gotten up. He said, now don't get it twisted. The thing that makes me different from you, although our hearts might be the same, the power doesn't rest the same on us. You call on me when you need my help, but I call on my Father when I need his help. And I don't need you pulling me out. I am responsible for pulling you out. So although it looks the same, it's never been the same. Because when he showed up for me, he found me in my mess. 
But when I showed up for him, he said to me, why do you look for the living amongst the dead? Where did you think I was going to be? Didn't I tell you? Ah, didn't I tell you that if they kill this bodily temple, that I raise it up in three days? Didn't I tell you? Stop. Pause. 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 Right? Watch this. Because uh, hmm, this is important. <laughs> How many of you have ever gone on a vacation? You've gone on a trip. I know how y'all do, so don't ever try to fake the phone call. And I say, don't. I'm not the only one. You go, you get to your room, get to your little hotel. Before you do anything, you got to go by Walmart. Um, yes, we're getting some disinfectant. We're getting some Febreze. We're going to put our sheets on, get them pillowcases out of here. I don't know who working here. I don't trust nobody here. This is what we do, right? All right? You go, you might get new sheets. You get disinfectant. You get all that stuff. But you don't buy too much. When you, go, when, you, when you go to Walmart, you don't look at that art piece and say, man, that's beautiful. That'll look dope in my hotel room. You, you don't do that. You don't go by the furniture store and say, I don't like this sofa in my room. Get that sofa. You're going to bring that up to room 1129. You don't do that. Why don't you do that? Because this room is seasonal. This room is seasonal. I, we don't need to spruce it up too long because I'm not going to be here but for so long. Now, the Bible says that when our Savior uh -huh. came down from the cross uh -huh. and they took him mm, <laughs> and they took him to the cemetery and they said, we're going to put him in that plot over there. How much that cost? It's 10000 Now, he don't need that. He, he don't need that. 10000 is for a lifetime. Mm -mm. No, no. This is just a weekend stay. We, we, we only going to be here for, we don't even need to buy nothing. Just let me borrow something for the weekend because I don't plan on staying here for too long. Now, why is this important? Why is this important? Hmm. Because the same seasonal rest that our Savior had in death to life is the same seasonal rest that God has planned for you. So we can't live through the blood, the, 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 the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus if we keep bringing our dead selves. So why have you extended your stay in a seasonal place? They broke your heart, but I came to heal it. Why are you allowing the break to supersede the healing? Why are you allowing what they stole to supersede what I'm trying to give? So just as our Savior stayed there just for a moment, your time is up. And the word of the Lord is coming into this room to say, where, where did they lay you? When they broke your heart, where did they lay you? Because I'm not liking this new version of you. I don't see myself in this new version of you. When, 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 mm, Jesus, mm. because what does this mean? Because we would not be able to walk out the fullness of a salvific experience hmm. had all of Jesus who went upon the cross been all the Christ who came out of the tomb. Had he allowed his experience to dumb him down, then the fullness of his blood would not have been able to make us all of who God has called us to be. So if we could not find victory in Jesus dumbing himself down, because of the weightiness of his experiences, then why do we feel like we have permission to say, Lord, I know you made me for better, but that hurt too bad. So I'm just going to give you the post-crucified me. Mm -mm. Victory only comes when the pre-crucified you lives after the crucifixion. Because victory is when... Mm -hmm. Victory is when you can look at death, hell, and the grave and say, I'm the one that beat it all. So from this point on, you have to respond to the power that comes through my voice. And there's some things that have attempted to put its weight on you and to push and to press you down. And this is your season to speak back to what thought it had you. Through the power and the blood of my Savior, I'm coming alive again. Not a post-dated version of who I was, but all of who I was. If all of Jesus could come out of that tomb after coming off, off that cross, 
then all of you can come out of that divorce. Then all of you can come out of your child breaking your heart. Then all of you can come out of your dreams being deferred. It is only a moment. God wants all of you. So the question for us today is not where they laid him. But the question, ladies and gentlemen, is where did you decide to lay yourself? Jesus says, while they're looking for him at his tomb, he says, yeah, I'm not in there. Watch this. The Bible says in John chapter 20, when the disciples saw him, John chapter 20, verse 1 through 2, when the disciples saw him, the disciples believed. They saw him and they believed. But Mary stayed right there. Where's my Savior at? Where's my sa-? Angel's like, what are you crying for, girl? Like, he, he got where they put him at. And finally, she turns around. She looks at him and says, where did they put him? Jesus said, who you looking for? My Savior. Jesus, <laughs> this is so black. Jesus said, Mary. It's right there. It's in the Bible, I promise. It's in John chapter 20. Jesus said, Mary. And she looked at him and said, oh, my God, it is you. And she believed. And how did she respond? There's no sense in having a party here. The party is out there. There are way too many other people who have not gotten the email that I'm back. So from this point on, I need you to make it your mission that everywhere you go, that he got up. You don't have to stay where you are. He got up. He's alive again. The one whom they buried, who they put into that tomb, the one who they said it was over, he got up with all power in his hands. That is our mission, ladies and gentlemen. So as we walk into this season, and I bid you adieu, next weekend is one of the biggest, it is the Super Bowl of all Christendom. And you cannot, dare not, step over dead people thinking you're going to worship a live, living Christ. When Easter is not just about a celebration of what he did, it is about a belief and a faith activation for what he can do. So maybe you don't know him, but let me introduce you to a man. Maybe you never heard of him. Let me introduce you to a man. Maybe your family didn't believe in this. And so you ain't got to believe, but let me introduce you to a man. If you get into his presence, something will change your life. You don't have to, if, if the Lord leads, you win him to Jesus this week. But if the window doesn't open, it's okay. Just bring him next week. And we are planning and preparing an atmosphere. We're, mm, how do, you, how do you know that, Pastor T? Hmm. Jeez, I don't want to offend nobody. Um, our generation has become so inundated with the laying on of hands, and I do believe it. But I also saw where some people who were sick walked in the shadow of the disciples, and their bodies were healed. I want, I, I want that elevated level of power that when I'm not even paying attention, somebody walks through my shut. What? What just, what just happened? I just felt something come out of me. I think somebody's life was just changed through the power of Jesus. What just happened? The power of God is still present at that level if we would just believe. The Bible says, lastly, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For the joy that was set, you know, I'm sorry, for so long, I emphasized the joy, boy, I emphasized the joy set before him as being him having opportunity to sit down at the right hand of the Father. And it's beautiful. It's not incorrect. It's incomplete. That's kind of a selfish perspective 
of our Savior. But the Bible says he endured the cross and despised the shame. That means that this action was taking place while he was stretched. It was hurting with the nails in his hand and in his feet. He uttered these seven last words. All the while, he doesn't have the strength to stand on his feet because the nails hurt. So in order to be able to find rest in his feet, he pulls himself with his nail-pierced hands. His lungs are collapsing in such a way it is hard to speak. But his words are so important, he endured the pain at least seven times to communicate a critical last message. And the Bible says, while upon the cross, he endured the cross and despised the shame for the joy that was set. What joy? It's more than just sitting at the right hand of the Father. Because the Bible says that typically when people were crucified, because they didn't want to leave them upon the cross, they would come and break their legs. And the Bible says that the officers came and broke the legs of the first thief and broke the legs of the second. And they decided not to break the legs of our Jesus. Instead, they took a spear, not knowing what they were doing, but it was a part of the prophetic picture. They took a spear and speared him in his side. This is different. Because he has been bleeding all day. One of the things he doesn't have much left of is blood. But when they pierce his side, the Bible says that blood and water begin to flow. Blood is the place of life and water is the place of cleansing. Uniquely blood and water begin to flow out of his side. And something happened in that moment. The joy wasn't just sitting at the right hand of his father. It was knowing that this blood is so you can be saved and you could be saved and you could be saved and you could be saved if you could be saved. If you would just believe enough to bring him closer to the cross. Next week, I don't want you to stand and celebrate an empty cross without bringing somebody closer to the blood. That's what this is all about. And while we're at it, it's not just about them. It's about the completion of the work that God has began in you. The salvation of your full self, not the part of you that you have left. God is not content with Christians who are dumbing down their life's experience because of pain. I am the healer of broken hearts. You've got to be able to trust me. And give it all to me. Pain comes in different colors, different sizes. For some, pain makes you go silent. For some, pain makes you go mute. For some, pain makes you become a bit of a hobbit. I don't want to be around anybody. I don't want to go anywhere. For some, pain becomes the point in which you can't stop. It's anesthesia. I just got to do, got to do, got to do. Because as long as I'm doing, I don't hurt. And Jesus said, I come to heal all that. The busy you, the broken you, the acting you, the part of you that don't feel anymore, the part of us that have come so bitter we say whatever we want. We don't feel anymore, so when other people are hurt, it doesn't phase us because I've lost all sense of touch, sensitivity, and feeling. I'm coming for that too. This season is not just about where have we laid him, but where did you lay you? We're going to resurrect that part of you.